Hello, this is John Gill. I'm the Chief Training Officer for the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and want to welcome you to this edition of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's uh, podcast. Our guest today is Tom Cronkright, and Tom's going to share his story. He worked in, he's a lawyer, and he can give you his background in a second, and he was working doing real estate transactions, and they got ripped off with some fake wire transfers. And it made him so mad. He's like, somebody ought to put a stop to this. What can I do? So that's he's made it his life's mission since then to try and prevent other people from falling victim to what he and his uh, partner had to put up with. And so he's going to share uh, the story of his fraud and what he's been doing uh, to prevent it. So, Tom, welcome. John, thank you, and I, I really appreciate you having me on on the podcast. Our pleasure. So, give me a little bit about your background and where you went to school and how you ended up having to deal with uh, fake wire transfers in the first place. Sure. Um, undergrad in finance and economics at, uh, at Western Michigan University and then law school at, uh, at Wayne State. Uh, met my best friend and now business partner, Lawrence Dutler, uh, in the uh, cafeteria of Wayne Law. We started at some top law firms together in the corporate practice group, and then ultimately uh, found ourselves in the title industry, more by experience as we were working as transactional lawyers. So title ended up being kind of the gum in the gear of these transactions that we were working on professionally. So we started, like any lawyer, smartest person in the room, how hard can things be? We started a title agency in, uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan called Sun Title going on about 19 years ago um, and have grown into one of Michigan's largest uh, title agencies uh, across the state. So um, our interaction with wire fraud came 10 years into the business and it was the spring of 2015 when we were asked to process uh, the a purchase and sale of a gas station on the Southeast side of Grand Rapids. And as part of that transaction, we received a certified check uh, for just under $200,000. And we started to process the transaction, do the title work, work up some closing statements. Um, and as part of the purchase agreement, it said that when due diligence or inspections uh, were completed, uh, 180,000 uh, of that check was to be wire transferred to the seller as, uh, as hard money earnest deposit, essentially. It was a distressed property. It had tax liens and it had some environmental liens and things on it. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. And I was the one that actually called the bank and approved uh, or received approval that the check had fully cleared through the Federal Reserve. It had been deposited for, for a number of days. And uh, we did that. We wire transferred out $180,000 to, uh, to the seller, which we believed was in New York at the time. And a couple of days later, we received a notice from our bank and we banked with a, one of the largest banks in the country at the time. And they said that check had bounced uh, that we had wired off of. So here we find ourselves uh, essentially short in our escrow file, $180,000, uh, having wired from Grand Rapids to, to New York. Uh, we had to make good on that shortage just based on you know, our, our escrow law. And then uh, two years of civil litigation and a Department of Justice trial, a very high profile federal trial later, uh, we, we got a real learning in this uh, this now popular topic, unfortunately, of real estate, real estate wire fraud. Um, so, John, I can I can dive deeper into that whole experience if you'd like, but that's the quick flyover of 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 how we found ourselves uh, in fighting wire fraud on a daily basis. Now, it, one thing I would like to to point out, if you've never worked in this area before, because I have uh, a I've been ACFE for a long time and I talked to a lot of different people and I'm always amazed that people don't seem to understand like, well, if it's a fraud, if you get a fraudulent check or fraudulent payment and then you relying on that, send money to somebody else, like, well, if for some reason the check bounces or the transfer is no good, well, the bank's going to refund all of your money. I'm like, that's not how this works. No. And so I think that's one of the first things, like set the ground rules, just in case you've not dealt with this before. Can you explain, uh, you know, where does the risk pass 
from party to party, when you receive money from someone else, whether it's check or wire, and it's deposited in your account, and then you send money to somewhere else, kind of where does the the risk lie in that transaction in the state? Yeah, so so we we call it tuition, and you know it it cost us roughly one hundred eighty thousand dollars to to learn a valuable lesson, and the single valuable lesson uh, that that we learned is that a certified check, and I'll put certified in air quotes is no different than a starter check if somebody just opened an account and it needs to fully clear to that issuing institution through the Federal Reserve. That is not a day or two or three process. In fact, if it's out of state and it's a smaller institution for which it was drawn upon, and those that's the scenario pattern that or the fact pattern we found ourselves in, that could take up to 10 days. So Again, we had a very large bank saying, no markers on this check, you're good to go. And then all of a sudden, when it finally cleared and it was finally presented through the system to what we thought was the, the regional institution um, on the other side of the country, they said, well, this, this is a bogus check. You bring up another good point. Wire transfers are immediate. In real-time payment transfers, which are in pilot right now, are more immediate than that in the sense that your ability to recall those funds, uh, those are good funds. And money mules, and I could walk into how sophisticated the money mule network is that we uncovered, they're standing ready uh, in a moment's notice to take your funds and then divert those into uh, either other wires or cash, cashier's checks, gift cards, uh, they splinter that into multiple different ways to avoid uh, detection and ultimately put it into the hands of the organizers of these crimes. And in our case, it was a it was a global syndicate that was operating this entire fraud that that hit us. Well, since you brought it up, let's let's talk about that a second. So, if when is a when is it safe to rely on the funds from a wire transfer? The funds coming in from a wire transfer are immediately available or good funds. The challenge is, though, is you receive a check and it's a certified check. So it looks like it's coming from the right institution or the proper party. And then you're asked to wire off of that. And that happens all the time. It happens all the time in real estate. So do I really have good funds on a certified check basis if it hasn't fully cleared that initiating institution? Because if I initiate and release that wire today, I'm pushing good funds out without a doubt. So transfers in and transfers out. I mean, I'll say this, John, wire transfers are the safest way to move money, especially in large amounts. So as far as I know, they're, they're not going into the Federal Reserve and diverting in real time the traffic between the initiating and receiving banks and the Federal Reserve as the intermediary. What we're seeing is these wire frauds are... The, it's failed. It's almost like doomed at the start because they're either basing that request off of a bogus check or now they become so sophisticated with business email compromise. Somebody is voluntarily sending to a party that they believe is the trusted party in the transaction only to find out this person's been impersonated and it's a fraudster impersonating or posing as this trusted party. Okay. So that's where your biggest risk occurs with wire transfers if it because once you initiate the transfer and you give the bank the instructions and say it's uh i'm sending this money from my account to this swift number this you know account number if it turns out later that's fraudulent the bank is not responsible for making that up because the bank did what you told it to do send it to this account, the burden is on you to make sure that that's a valid account and that's where you wanted it to go. Is that? Yeah, you... I mean, and, and to put some weight behind it, it's, it's UCC Article 4, 4A that basically says, look, if, if, if you're the account holder and you have the authority to move money in this account, the bank is responsible for, for confirming the person requesting it is is authorized to make that request in the amount that's being requested. Uh, but after that, my understanding, and it's 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 you're creating precedent in federal court now, 
that says, look, we, we can't verify every wire transfer. We don't know your customer. We don't know your vendors and vice versa. So yeah, you're exactly right. You cannot look at your bank as the last line of defense to prevent the diversion of a wire transfer because that's not the seat that they sit in. That's the seat that the operating company or the owner of that account has to sit in. Correct. There's like, if you're sent into this account, it's on you to make sure that this is the correct account number. They're not, they're not going to say, oh, well, this is fraudulent because they don't know. No, in most banks, I mean, there, there's no requirement, at least as of this recording, that, that there's any um, name matching. So, for example, John, if I wanted to send you a wire transfer and a fraudster gets in the middle of our email communication and is posing as you, right? So let's say you're John Gill at Gmail and they open up John Gill 2 at Gmail and they've compromised someone's account. I'm looking at the account name and they could list your account name, right? You as the account holder. And there, unfortunately, there's no requirement through the Federal Reserve to do any kind of name matching. I, I tested this a few years ago. I sent and released a wire transfer and I put Winnie the Pooh as the account name. And I got a confirmation back with all the Fed rep numbers and all that and, and something nice for my bank that says, congratulations, your wire was successfully received by Winnie the Pooh. And I thought, that's, that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was for him. He could go out, buy some honey and... Yeah, exactly. I'll have a great time. Yeah. Your understanding is the same as mine. I haven't, I haven't talked to a bank employee. That is my understanding is they send the money to that account number. They don't even, they don't review the written documentation unless something's kicked back or there's a problem. And then they may go back and say, all right, well, this account holder is supposed to be Winnie the Pooh. That's what we have on the instruction, but there's no matching like, okay, receiving bank, here's this account number, is Winnie the Pooh the registered uh, right. customer here? They don't do that. They just send it to that account. And that's why it's so, like you said, vitally important that you send it to the right spot because they're not they're not checking it. So any checking of who what who belong who owns this account and if this is the proper number going to the proper place, that's going to be on you. That's one hundred percent. I believe that. I believe that to be true, John. And again, I I think some of the banks have created um, cooperative networks. They've done things proactively with technology on their end, but that that has not been a grant. That has not been an update on on the Uniform Commercial Code, nor has it been an update on any type of federal law regulation. I think that's been more voluntary to keep the phone ringing less um, on their fraud departments. Correct. And I, I do know of instances where uh, under Know Your Customer, they're looking at their account holder and their activity. And if they're trying to send wire transfers to a foreign country, someplace that they don't normally uh, do business with, then sometimes they will flag the customer and say, look, we got this request. You're trying to send this money uh, to Panama. Are you sure because uh, that you want to do this? And it's more from, like you said, they're trying to protect the authorized access to the funds at their account, but it's still not necess It's not verifying who's getting it. They're just saying transfer. You don't normally transfer hundreds of thousands of dollars out of your account at our institution and send it overseas. We saw that. We just want to verify that's you. Yeah, 100%. Now, explain real-time payments. This is something new. It's not something I'm sure I really have a handle on. So we have a check, which old, really old technology. Wire transfer is a little bit newer. Now we have real-time payments. Explain uh, how that works and what's the difference. Yeah, so the, there's two rails right now. It's a new payment rail. My understanding, we haven't had a payment rail uh, that was introduced since uh, ACH. So we're going on decades. And the the simplest way that I would describe it, there, there's the clearinghouse and then there's FedNow. Uh, both of them are operational. And essentially what it does is it creates an express lane from initiating to receiving financial institution where payments can clear inside of a two-minute period. 
So you have a sending bank saying, hey, receiving bank, we've got a request for a real-time payment, receiving bank, and there's this protocol that was created by the Federal Reserve uh, for, these, for these institutions. And it really settles within a matter of seconds. Um, so it'll just depend on, you know, again, traffic, but, uh, but the outside lane is within two minutes. So the promise of that, John, so let's just say in real estate, what's the promise of real-time payment as it relates to the security of transfers is that if you're person to person and your financial institutions are all set up on both sides to send and receive, you could initiate transfer and receive confirmation inside of a couple minute period. And I think that that world is something that we would that we would all embrace. I think there's a huge promise. Um, I think of it like a Venmo or a Zelle on a larger rail, right? So now you've got a rail of a million dollars to start right. and then it will go up from there. So it's just like that. So if John, if I owed you 10 bucks for the pizza party on Friday, you'd see that show up in a matter of seconds from when we're talking right now, if I initiated that through Venmo. Um, and real-time payments is that. It's 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 not directly a peer-to-peer because -peer you do have a clearinghouse. The Federal Reserve still does initiate that communication link back and forth. You get immediate confirmation of the transfer, but it does not fill in this gap that we're talking about right now. And it does not send confirmation to the sender of the payment um, on what account actually received it. So okay. you're still dealing with an account and routing number, you're still dealing with an account name, but that account name under the Secrecy Act and other privacy you know, rules and laws, uh, they cannot share down to the account holder level. So if you take out the in-person to in-person, then you end up still with this gap and the gap really is about identity verification. And that's really what, what caused us to lose almost $200,000 and what has now grown into what we call business email compromise is that if, if a fraudster ends up um, compromising or infiltrating an email account of two parties that are transacting business, and we're talking about real estate, but to your point earlier, it's agnostic. It can be healthcare, it can be municipals, we had a school here, you know, last couple of years that lost $2 million on a contract uh, to upgrade a school. I mean, it, it's happening everywhere. And the social engineering and how these fraudsters are using uh, exposed email accounts, now artificial intelligence, open source information on individuals, they're, they're presenting these fraudulent uh, accounts or accounts that are in the hands of bad actors, and they're diverting literally tens of billions of dollars a year uh, to people that are voluntarily sending money. They think they're doing the right thing, and it ends up in, it ends up in fraudulent hands. Well, because they all have the same problem in common, which is what we were talking about before. The burden is on you to verify the identity of the account holder to where you're sending the money. So tell me about where uh, you and your partner, uh, Lawrence, were like, okay, there's a, we need a better, easier way to check identity. And it, it's sometimes it's frustrating because you don't know where to go, where to start. So what what did you come up with as a as a solution? Well, uh, let, John, can I take 60 seconds? Let me give you a quick pass of our whole experience. Sure. Because I think it will amplify just how sophisticated these fraudsters and these syndicates operate. So our money goes from Grand Rapids to New York. We had a, a German uh, a German national that had flown in the day before, professional money launderer received the money um, at a bank branch in Manhattan, um, took out her payment, which was about 10%, the going rate's about 10% for a money mule, and then pushed a series of wires down to, to Texas. In Texas, there was an attorney using his IELTA account to launder hundreds of millions of dollars, and then another series of bad actors. So we actually litigated for two years in Bell County, Texas, okay, to try to get that money back. We ended up settling out after two years, and then uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office had called because what they had found is a defendant that we had 
that we had added to our pleadings and ultimately settled with didn't actually exist. It was an alias of a Nigerian that was operating the Black Axe Syndicate from Toronto, and he was running the North American operations. So then what we learned from that is say, wait a second, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with Grand Rapids, like it's a very conservative, it's a great city, it's conservative. And we thought, well, who's going to, who's going to pick a fight one with a couple of lawyers, but secondly, who cares about $180,000, right? Aren't these scams more like the multi-million dollar ransomware scams or the, you know, something with at least another comma or two in it. And that's just not the case. And the, the challenge you have with law enforcement is, you know, we knew the U.S. attorney well. Uh, he was a member of the Grand Rapids Bar and the Michigan Bar. And there was no commitment to prosecute or even investigate a single instance of a $180,000 theft. Uh, it, it just wasn't there. So, so what we realized, and it was really during my trial prep, and I was one of the lead witnesses for uh, for the trial for the Department of Justice, ended up in 38 convictions total. They took down this whole syndicate that was operating in North America. Uh, but on my way back, I had protective detail because of safety concerns um, on other witnesses. I was riding back with my detail and I asked a simple question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question, John, after this. And I said, hey, what keeps you up at night? And this is a member of the FBI's cyber crime division. And he said, social engineering. The way that they get these people to do things and recruit them thinking they're supporting a charity. So you receive checks and wires and you send checks out or you're working for an accounting department of a multinational corporation or some romance scam or elderly scam. He said it's incredible and they're recruiting them and they're turning them into money launderers. They just don't know it. So that left us with this idea that said, wait a second, especially in real estate, there's no muscle memory in a real estate transaction except for the real estate agent, the title company, and the lender. But the buyer and the seller are completely exposed. And it's unique in the sense that you have roughly six to eight participants in a transaction, and all the information to get started is online. You open public record of ownership, every square inch of this country, you can find out who owns it. And then secondly, the real estate agent syndicates all the listing data and, and information about themselves. So the lesson learned there really was, wait a second, they have a leg up and it's the largest transaction of people's lives. You're moving trillions of dollars a year in real estate transactions through escrow accounts and attorney IOLTA accounts. These aren't bank to bank transfers. The intermediary is the title settlement industry of the closing attorneys. So what we identified is to say, wait a second, if we don't have the ability at critical points in time in a transaction to validate that we're communicating with the party that is presenting as seller or buyer or mortgage company or whoever's about to send or receive money, somebody could get nabbed. Somebody could be harmed. And that's what was lacking. So between our incident, which again, huge lessons learned there, the trial prep and what we went through to participate in bringing these uh, the syndicate to justice, the, the post game of that, really the reflection on that was technology has to play a role in the proper identification and then the secure sharing of bank credentials that will lead to safe transfers. Because what's interesting, we talk about wire fraud, we talk about business email compromise, the fraud, John, really is social engineering, it's impersonation, and it's monetized through the diversion of funds. Well, it's, no, you're exactly right. It, how, if if you're just dealing with emails and instant messages and things on the internet, how in the world can you know that who I'm, who you're dealing with? Well, you, you can't. And then, and then you, and there's two other layers here, John, I don't mean to cut you off. One more layer is there's no housing inventory. There's a month or less of supply in almost every major market. And then without that, so you have a concern that buyers and sellers have to hold these deals together. The real estate agents need the deal to be held. Right? Everybody just has this outsized concern about every single transaction getting to close. So if I'm a buyer, let's just talk about buyer, you know, buyer fraud. 
I'm a fraudster and I want to divert the buyer's closing funds obligations. So let's say it's $100,000. Well, as a buyer, I probably put in six offers, missed out on my first six homes. I finally attached myself to a purchase agreement on the seventh, right? And I mean, I've got to get to the finish line on this thing. So when a text message shows up saying, hey, I'm Acme Closing Company and I'm stepping in for John who's sick and I need to get a wire transfer from you or it's going to delay or possibly cancel the closing, there's just this override effect that we're seeing that you could have a buyer that was was told about or, ex, or educated on the issue of wire fraud, but in the moment when now it affects them in their personal interest, it, it just can have this, um, this diverting effect <laughs> logically to say, wait a second, your agent told you never wire funds without calling. You got a simple text message and your life savings is now sitting in you know, the Philippines what or Bitcoin? Like what? What ha- Tell me what happened in the last twenty four hours. Well, it's always that sense of urgency, and I think that's why real estate transactions are such a natural uh, target there, because they're like, oh, well, if you if we don't get the money by five o'clock p.m., then it's all over with. We're going on the next buyer, and you know, people you know, get freaked out. They're like, well, I have to get it there, have to get it there. And and everything just, you know, common sense sometimes flies out the window. Uh, so when you're talking to people, talk about what what can you do to help prevent yourself from becoming a victim? Yeah, I, I think the, the first line of defense, and I, and I think this will remain true um, for the foreseeable future is just education and engagement. And I think the engagement piece of it is, is important. So we talked about some of the attributes of a real estate transaction that make it unique. You've got multiple parties. You've got, you know, largest sticker price of an asset changing hands that, that faces the general public. Uh, the largest transfer of funds that most people will make in their lifetime is connected with real estate, either receiving or sending. Um, but you also have a large and very transparent transaction cycle. So the average transaction cycle is 42, 43 days. And think about it, John, what other transaction could you identify is actually underway right now that is the size of real estate? You can't because the MLS and the syndication of that data, it's just one property after another as a target deal board for these fraud syndicates. So I think real estate will continue to be a top target, educating at the point of initiation. So for lenders and those in risk management departments of financial institutions, this is that loan application. This is that initial pre-qualification letter. Put something, I, I, I call this the face mask grab. This isn't the subtle conversation. This is like, look, you're looking at buying a house. We'd love to be your mortgage lender. You could lose your life savings. And I need you, I need to send you some information and acknowledge that you received it, right? And that information just needs to properly read them in. Hey, wire fraud's an issue. Here's how it could prevent itself. I'm not going to know as the lender. Title company's not going to know. Your agent's not going to know what's taking place. We're going to find out at the closing table. When the closing escrow officer asks you for a check and you say, you know what? I wired two days ago. What are you talking about? And I think with that, continuing with the real estate professional at the listing agreement or the buyer agency, then that thread gets continued at escrow and title clearance and closing prep. So I say educate, but it's the engagement piece. It's that continuum that makes sure that they're continuing to be re-educated or, or maybe made aware, right? Because as the end of month builds in our industry, People get busier and more closings take place. You know, 80% of closings take place in the last 10 days of the month in real estate. It's just how it works. And then people just get distracted. And uh, to your point, there's always a sense of urgency uh, that is associated with it. And I think, I think, and then asking, so if you're a consumer, asking how, how are you keeping my funds protected? What technology, what systems, what procedures, like 
what does success look like and how are you ensuring my success in this area? And an interview a couple closing attorneys or escrow companies and see what their response to that is. And if you get a blank stare, it's time to Google another. <laughs> like You shouldn't have a blank stare in this area. It should be, oh, thanks for asking. I'm glad you care. Let me tell you exactly what we do to, to walk your hand, to grab your hand and walk you down the path to, uh, to a safe and successful closing. Almost seems like one of the things that you should be on the alert for is never trust email alone. So if you get instructions to send a lot of money and it gives you the all the different numbers and all the wire transfer instructions, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call whomever you're you're dealing with. If if you work through an attorney or real estate agent and say, look, I got this uh, email, it's got these wire instructions. Let me show this to you. Can you verify that this is the correct information? Yeah, I, I think that's right. So when, when we found it certified, that's the company name, right? We, we, we have technology that stops wire fraud through secure software, insurance, and recovery services. So we have a whole team that all they do is receive inbound requests from wire fraud victims to help recover funds. And we have relationships with federal law enforcement. The interesting thing, thing there is in almost every single case, when we ask a consumer, were you, or a victim, I should say, were you aware of the, the risk of wire transfer fraud and how much education did you have around that? And I'm saying nine, 99 out of 100 cases that we would take, and we take hundreds a year, they say, I didn't even know this was possible. I didn't even know this was a thing. And I think, John, that, that's where we got to back this up and say, wait a second, as a community, in the real estate transaction, again, lending, real estate professionals, title settlement, we've got to do a better job of bringing our consumers along in this process. But the same is true, we talked about other industries, auto loans, high ticket equipment, I mean, letters of credit, all these areas where sums of money and commitments are being made, it's the same scam, it's just the, the monetization through a different asset class. So your company will help people if they have been ripped off. Uh, you help them try and recover uh, the funds back. Do you also have as part of that things in place to uh, help people as part of the initial transaction, how to, to verify the people they're doing business with? Yeah, our, our system verifies that the the party either sending or receiving funds is dealing with the party on the other side that they believe they're dealing with. So they call it the man in the middle, right? So we have the ability to, to look in, in geo target and, and look into device analysis and the technology that we use essentially says, look, John, if I'm trying to send money to you, you're, you're working through a trusted device connected here in the U S we look at all this metadata on the device and then I'll run you through, you know, some knowledge authentication that that with questions only you would know. And then we use some additional tokenization. Uh, so basically, we're saying, look, we need to we need to create two proof points, point A and point B. Point A may be sending to point B. Uh, point A might be receiving from point B. But either way, money is being transferred and we create that secure, authenticated bridge of identity. And that's that was the lesson learned from us is. We really have an identity problem because we're so dependent on real-time digital communication, email, text messaging, even phone now with artificial intelligence. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. The artificial intelligence that we're seeing used for fraudulent actions is speeding up the rate at which people um, are falling for these scams. So you're taking out a whole middle layer of the fraud syndicate. So before, you'd have to have somebody domestically that understood real estate, that could craft the email, that understood the nuances between Michigan and Minnesota and you know, Washington uh, transactions. That's not the case anymore. And they can craft an email. It's pitch perfect. It's even formatted properly. It gets through the email filter. And then you see a money-muling network, especially this year, that's moving money faster than ever. 
So you get the money and then all of a sudden it's going to Bitcoin. It's going to, to multiple different wire uh, or wire transfers out of that receiving account. Um, th those are the types of things that, that we're concerned about. But part of that, you're exactly right, is we have a fraud recovery services team uh, that around the clock and, and weekends are, are some of our busiest times uh, that we have that uh, desk staffed is people that have gone into a closing on a Friday only to learn their life savings did not arrive at the closing office, but is somewhere else. No, and it's it, it's great to have some place uh, for people to turn because it can be, uh, depending on the, the amount, like you said, this is life altering. I mean, you're like, it's truly your life savings is hanging in the balance. So, uh, well, it's not only life altering, but it, I call it the bat bottom of the pyramid. I mean, this is shelter. So, in this market, you've already sold your house. You've already you've already told your landlord that you're moving out. Like this has to close because I showed up to the closing office in the rented box truck. Like my stuff's in the parking lot and we're doing this thing, John. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's that's what's devastating. And we have seen, you know, families that have been sleeping in, you know, sleeping in vans or threatening to take their own life. I mean, it's a it's a dark place, unfortunately, that people go because of the shame and blame and the the ripple effect that this has. And especially for those in the baby boomer segment now, they downsize, their house has been paid off, they're exiting at some outsized value of the family home. And that $700,000 was my retirement. Like that was it, or that was the inheritance. So I agree, yes, we could pencil a, a a dollar value to it, it's really hard to pencil or measure the emotional and the, the human tax that this pays. And, and I felt it. I mean, you, you just feel, you feel a sense of absolute violation when, when somebody does this to you. Um, and I think that's a, that's a natural reaction. Well, and that's a probably a good place to end is, is don't, anytime somebody's pushing you to do something, that's a, that's a red flag. It's like, look, if this is a legitimate transaction, they should allow you the time to check and double check and verify the information. If if they're not allowing you to do that, that's something you should be on the alert for. And also, like you said, remember, this isn't buying Taylor Swift tickets. This is one of the largest purchases you may uh, make in your lifetime. And so before you... I'll tell your bank to send money to somebody else. You need to stop and take the time to double, triple check all of the information and, and be aware that it's your money and you need to be responsible for it. And it's uh, there's a limit to what the bank is responsible for. And so you need to, to make sure you're taking that responsibility to know if you're going to move money from your bank to somewhere else that you know that that's going to the right spot. No, I, I agree with that, John. The, the challenge in real estate is a lot of times, especially for buyers, this is the first time they've ever been asked to wire money in their lives. So when we go back to the education and the engagement piece, if the professionals hired to, to walk them through and guide them through this transaction are not reading them into this risk, they, they just don't know what's out there, right? And I, I completely agree with you. You've got to have the ability to slow the gear down, make that that trusted check-in before, you know, before money transfers. Well, great. Well, Tom, I appreciate it. If people are interested or they want to know more information, the, your website, what's your website address? Yeah, certified.com, C-E-R-T-I-F-I-D.com. Okay, and it, it's at least... Something I think you also have. Uh, I notice on there tips for consumers and for people, and so you've got some uh, a lot of information on there about educating yourself on how to 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 not hopefully not get scammed by this and double and triple check is uh, I guess the the, the message uh, from this podcast. And you're right that the artificial intelligence is is getting scarier. Uh, every day, I, I saw a news story where they, uh, one of the news reporters, they had 
using YouTube videos of him were able to imitate his voice to where you you really could not tell the difference. And um, they were illustrating, you know, like the ransom scheme. Like oh, I've been high, you know, I've been kidnapped saving this money, and I'm like, it it really did sound just like. Uh, it, it did not sound like a robot, like the initial incarnations. They're getting really good at this. And so they're they're learning how to impersonate people and they're learning how to do this on a larger scale and finding the information. And so you 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 can't trust anybody anymore. So be extra careful. Yep, totally agree, John. All right. Well, Tom, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And so uh, this has been another edition of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's podcast. I want to thank again Tom Cronkright uh, for his contribution to this and for all that valuable information. And so thank you for listening. This is John Gill, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.